Morning, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Um, all right. So, a couple of years ago, I had a mission. My mission was to create an API. Not uh, a very fancy API, though, but uh, a RESTful API with the hypermedia stuff and a simple authentication method. Then I said, yeah, all right, I am ready. Uh, but there was some weird stuff happening because I had to uh, create some tokens in order to say, okay, uh, basically exchange your credentials for a token so you can use the API uh, back and forth. Uh, but that token should expire. Okay, I will just store that information in the database. It's mo the most natural way to, to do that. Uh, some months later, uh, I was asked to, to do like, now we have two clients. Some tokens can only be ex uh, used by one of these clients. Ah, okay. Let's stuck that into the database again. And more of these things kept coming, and you can see that it was wonderful. Everything was perfect, but no. The database was a mess. We, have, uh, we had expired tokens in a database. Uh, we had a lot of issues there. And from the, when I look at that mess, I said, okay, I'm done. We need something simple uh, in order to work. Yeah, my clicker is not good. Uh, we need it simple. And my name is Luis Cobucci. I'm a Brazilian developer living in Amsterdam. Uh, I help um, Ocremios to break doctrine. Uh, I also help Rafael to ruin everything on Amsterdam PHP. I work at Werksport, it's a Dutch company that also has some business in Instapro, uh, in Italy as Instapro. Uh, and after I went through all these database troubles, I found something very interesting. Uh, it was uh, a work that started in 2012. Uh, it was basically to have uh, smart tokens, a self, uh, everything was in the token and it was very easy to understand and uh, how to use it. The name of it was JSON Web Tokens. In order to start this, the best thing I can do is to show a token for you. This is a token. Uh, it looks familiar, right? Oh, come on! Don't this, uh, this looks like uh, base64 encoding st strings, right? A bit. Because it is kind of a base64 encoding. For those that doesn't know about uh, base64, just keep one thing in mind. It's not encryption. That's enough. But basically, it's a way to have a binary safe string. So if you have a string that, that contains binary data, you can just encode it with that algorithm and you, ha you can just pass it around and you, it will be safe. But the problem is um, we have some dots here and base64 encoding doesn't have dots. The idea of the dots is to, to serve as separators. And there's another difference here in this encoded string. Uh, because it's a variation of a base64 encoding. It's what we call base64 URL. Basically, it converts some characters in order to make it safe uh, to be passed uh, in a query string or basically uh, on a URL, any part of it. Okay, uh, so now that we know how to decode this token, let's apply that algorithm. And the result will be this. So, yeah, we have a JSON. Perfect. 
We can do all sorts of things. We can store anything in the JSON and pass it around, right? The first use case, or the most common use case, is uh, about authorization and authentication, where you have two sides of it, the client and an API. The client basically presents uh, the credentials, the API validates the credentials. This is basically uh, an example of the, the object that you can use uh, as JSON content. We're going to talk about what does it mean. Uh, and the, the API sends the token back. And for next uh, request, the token with, will be passed as authorization header. And the uh, API will be able to say, OK, is the signature valid? Uh, is this client allowed to use this token? Uh, uh, the, the issuer was me, or somebody else issued this token? Uh, and can this token be used at this moment? Another common use case, and, and that uh, helps a lot, is uh, links. Have you ever uh, needed to create uh, a reset password uh, token or email? Uh, and you needed to store things in the database or find a way to be able to expire this token. With JSON Web Token, it makes very simple because you can set, okay, the expiration of this token is in two days. So uh, the user is the user one, two, or three. You will have a string, and you can just pass it uh, on the URL. The same thing happens uh, with the, the pages that uh, you need, uh, like the, the user must be logged to, to use a content, and you want to, from an email, you want to log in the user. You can also use a JSON Web Token to do that. CSRF validation. Ocremius created this library uh, that basically uh, puts the, the ID. So uh, let's go back a bit. Uh, CSRF is basically a security measure to make sure that nobody is, uh, the, the, the user sending the form is the right user and you uh, certifies that. So usually you put uh, a token in your session and this goes also in the form. Uh, when you have the request, you, you receive the token on, on the form and validates, okay, is this the same token or not? Um, so you can also use uh, JSON Web Tokens to, to implement that. So the token that goes in, in the form is a smart token. It's the one that knows about expiration and all sorts of things. So this library is pretty nice uh, and helps you to manipulate this inside forms. And a different use case uh, is regarding sessions. Uh, the standard PHP session basically works with cookies, right? So uh, you have something, uh, some data that the web serv server stores into a file, gets an identifier, and sends it back to the client, right? That happens when you do a session start, view everything on the session super global, and uh, ends the request, and you have the session there. On the next request, the server, uh, the client will send the, the same identifier, and the server will know, okay, uh, I will fetch the, the file with that name, and I will know uh, all the data that is stored there. This involves uh, storing, so I.O., uh, also serializing, uh, because session data is serialized in order to be stored into a file. Uh, and there's an issue that if you have this kind of setup, uh, you just have two, basically two choices. Either you create, a, you remove the storage from the web server, or you just say, okay, uh, the load balancer will do a sticky session. So if the client goes, it was uh, processed on the server one, it will always go to the server one. This uh, involves a lot of things, and also relying on super globals is not really cool, right? 
Uh, so if you want, you can use a, to a JSON web token that basically contains the session data and it's passed to any web server and anyone can process that request. Of course, it has some uh, limitations, it has some issues that you need to understand because, well, Base64 is not encryption, do you remember? So you need to uh, ensure that you're not saving sensitive data inside of the token. Another library that you can use uh, is this one that we create together, uh, Chromius, me, and Maluquinho. Uh, and it's basically a middleware that you can uh, use to create uh, and manipulate uh, sessions using JSON Web Tokens. Now that you have uh, some ideas on how uh, a token can use can be used. Let's see uh, and understand it better on how uh, things works there. Uh, as you saw, uh, we had these two uh, JSON objects there. The first one represents the headers. The headers basically uh, have the information that uh, you you need to know in order to decode that token. Uh, so you can you will have a type, you will have an algorithm. Uh, you can have a key ID, as Adam uh, shown on his talk yesterday, uh, and you also have the, a list of claims. Uh, cl you ha basically we have three kinds of claims uh, in the JSON token, a web token specification: uh, the public claims, the register claims and the private claims. Uh, the list of uh, register claims is this one. So the idea of a JSON Web Token is to be compact. So the register claims, as uh, in the standard claims where you can use and uh, nobody can collide with them, uh, uh, it's basically this one. We have on the top the token ID, which is the identifier for the token, uh, the issuer, uh, so what was the, the server or the uh, host name that issued the token, basically an identification for that. Uh, the audience of the token, so uh, what are the clients that are permitted to consume this token or to use that token. So it can be just a single string or URI or an array of strings. The subject of the token, what the token relates to, and finally, the three informations about dates. Issue that, when the token was created, expiration, and not before, which is basically the minimum time where the token can be used. So uh, these three are very powerful because you can say, uh, I'm creating the token now. It can only be used uh, till tomorrow, but it cannot be used before um, of five minutes from now. So you, you can specify a very good range. And this numeric date uh, usually is represented using a Unix timestamp, as in integer, but it can also be a string uh, with, so it, it will be a timestamp uh, with microseconds. So it's very powerful, so how to manage that is really nice. Uh, the, f the first uh, register claims are case sensitive. So when you're validating them, you must be sure that you're uh, doing in the right way. Uh, apart from the register claims, we have the idea of public claims. Uh, public claims are basically claims that people from all around the world, they are using all the time the same claims. So it can be standardized sometime. So we like reserve them as public for some time and then we register them. The private claims are the, the claims that you want to use. It can be anything. Would be nice to keep the idea of short identifier so uh, you don't use a lot of space. Because again, it's a base 64 URL encryption, encoding, sorry. So yeah, just to see if you're awake or not. <laughs> um, so this uh, encoded string 
will uh, increase in size according to the data that is stored there. And it can get very big. So looking at it, this is uh, the token, uh, this is the content of token, and if we apply the, the, the thing, the encoding, we have this, uh, uh, the encoded result. But I want to, to point you that there's an ID there, right? So if I just encode it, it will be this, but it cannot be trusted because it's not encryption. Anyone can just decode the token, change the data, and pass it back to you. So how do you ensure the integrity of the, a token? Uh, we use signatures for that. Basically, you get the headers and the claims, encode them, uh, use the dot as a separator, and this string will be a payload for a signature algorithm that you now uh, basically say, okay, this is my key, this is my payload, create a hash for me, and I will use this hash as signature. Again, this signature is encoded with the same algorithm. Uh, so the same example using this key will create this token. Uh, now, uh, this is trustable because uh, if somebody changes the content, the signature will not match. Right? So, yeah, uh, unless they have your signing key, which is not recommended, right? Uh, enough of this. Let's see some PHP because, of, after all, we are in a PHP conference, right? Uh, so, as I said, the, um, the whole thing was created in, the, this movement of JSON Web Tokens started in 2012. Uh, in 2014, uh, I've created this library, or I started this library. Um, it's being used pretty well, I gotta say, and uh, we're very close to releasing a new major version. Uh, because, yeah, nobody uses PHP 5 anymore, so... <laughs> oh, come on! Uh, yeah, so I'm dropping PHP 5, and I'm dropping support of PHP 7 as well. Just, we'll support 7.1. Uh, yeah, because nullable types and void are awesome. Uh, so, what I'm going to show here is basically the usage of this new API. Everything starts with a configuration uh, that basically uh, is used as uh, a small dependency injection container because uh, all the objects has some objects like the builder or the parser they have some dependencies and if you are to pass these dependencies you can get very complicated so yeah let's put it in an easy way this configuration. Uh, was it basically uh, will hold the validator, the builder, and the parser. So here we're building a configuration for an asymmetric signer that's using RSA, uh, and you just pass two keys because it's asymmetric. We're going to talk about this in a few moments. Um, and so you have to specify the private key and the public key. Uh, then you start building your token. You get a configuration object, uh, and you're saying, okay, this token uh, is identified by this uh, ID, uh, was issued by this host. This is the list of permitted clients, uh, was issued at now. Uh, it's valid for uh, one hour, and can only be used after 30 seconds from now. Uh, and I have a private claim here. It's not that short. But it says user ID is one. And I just get a token uh, passing the, the signer and the signing key. And if I do um, a two string or uh, uh, I do a typecast first string, I will have my token. 
uh, as a string. Uh, this token is an object uh, that is immutable. So once it's created, you cannot modify anything. The result of this uh, string cast uh, uh, typecast will be this string, which is very long. But uh, you can see uh, we cannot find easily the dots there, but most of it uh, is basically the signature. It's using RSA. Uh, and if I want to parse the token, I just get it, uh, the, the, the JSON string, the JSON web token, go to the parser, and I have my object back. Okay, so I know how to create a token using PHP. I know how to parse a token using PHP. Uh, but I need to validate it. Right, because, yeah, what I'm doing with a string and with the data, if I was not the, the one that created the token or this is not my signature, I need to validate that. Uh, using the library, there are two methods that you can call to validate the token. One is basically, uh, you get the validator and you call validate. Uh, that will return true or false if the token is valid or not. Uh, or you can use a cert, and it will raise uh, an exception if the token is invalid, based on the constraint list that you're passing. Uh, you can create uh, customized uh, validators or constraints uh, if you want to, to check, like, okay, the user ID must be an integer and must exist in my database. So you can create uh, a validation for that if you want. Here, I'm basically checking if the, the token was issued by me, uh, is permitted uh, for this uh, client, and it's valid at now, and it was signed with my uh, signer and verification key, which is my public key. Uh, if you want more libraries, we have this page, which is very, very nice, because you can read there on top, uh, there's a debugger, where you can just put a token there and say, okay, uh, is this token valid or uh, what it contains, what is its body and uh, its headers. You can uh, easily see. And also for RSA and uh, HMAC, you can validate the, the signature. Uh, you, can, you have a filter there that says, okay, I want to see all the PHP implementations or the Java implementations. JavaScript, Go, whatever. You can just go there and see. All right, guys. So uh, we saw what is a JSON web token. We saw uh, how to use it, some ideas. It's important to say that uh, your imagination is the limit. You can use in all sorts of ways. Uh, I was talking with Ukremius, uh some days ago, and he, he had a, an idea to use it uh, with CAPTCHAs. So you can validate that and pass the token instead of putting things into the session. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, uh, on these years that I maintained this library, I, got, I, I had some questions about uh, the JSON web token usage. and so. Uh, I'm basically uh, bringing them. First question is, is it a replacement for uh, OAuth? Uh, short answer, no. The idea of uh, a JSON web token is basically to be a token. It doesn't say that uh, you need to use uh, to create this authorization and uh, authentication flow. No, it's, that's up to you. In fact, you can also combined uh, the JSON web token with the OAuth. Uh, if you see the, the OAuth server of the PHP League, uh, you will see that we have JSON web token support there. And it works fine. The access uh, key and also the refresh key, you can use JSON web tokens there. Uh, what is the best algorithm to uh, create your signatures. Yeah, 
That's uh, a question that you will hear a lot. Again, the short answer is just go for asymmetric uh, algorithms like RSA or ECDSA. Uh, we have untrusted to tokens, like the, the ones that doesn't have a signature. Uh, and uh, we have the uh, HMAC. The problem with HMAC is that it is a symmetric uh, in algorithm. So it has only one uh, key. That means that if you uh, need to, to verify your key uh, or your signature in a different place, you need to share that key. So that's why I recommend to use either uh, RSA or ECDSA. Uh, the difference between them, I must be honest, I don't know for sure. Uh, I know that uh, one use uh, elliptic, elliptic curves, sorry for the bad English, uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, you, you have some mathematical curves and you just use there. Uh, and the other uh, is RSA, I think you probably uh, know a bit. Uh, so the idea uh, of them are like, okay, when to use one or the other. You see it as say, uh, I know that it creates a shorter signature. So if you really need that, uh, and that's your only concern, go for that. Uh, if you need more information about cryptography, please, uh, you have Scott and Chris that are very good on that. Um, how to block tokens? Yeah, that's a very good question because once a token was created, it's there. Because there's no way to know if the token uh, was uh, created by, uh, uh, by this thing and, and it will basically uh, n not work anymore. You don't have the information of the token. So what we do is we use the JSON token ID to set a, uh, the identifier and if we want to, okay, this token is not, uh, uh, it, ca it cannot be used anymore even though it is, um, it's not expired. So we get the token ID and we create a blacklist. You can use uh, a cache uh, system to, to use that, setting like the, t t uh, the time to leave of the, the cache entry will uh, be the, the same amount of expiration. So the cache will do the cleanup for you. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, you can also create, using the library that I've shown, uh, the, a custom uh, constraint to see, okay, is this uh, token ID in my blacklist or not. Uh, how much data can I use in a token? Yeah, because you can just put everything in there, right? Uh, but the problem is your string will be very, very big. If you're using uh, a JSON web token for sessions, for example, uh, you have a limit on the, your cookie. It's not that big. so. You must be aware that everything uh, that you store there will impact on the size. So be cautious on that. Um, another question that I often get is how to secure the token because it's not an encrypted thing. It's basically, uh, you, you can verify the signature but you cannot say, okay, I want to, to protect the data. Uh, who was uh, on yesterday's talk about Jose? So you saw uh, the idea of JSON web encryptions, right? Uh, the idea is basically you have s the same structure or kind of the same structure as a JSON web token, but for an encrypted object. So you have, instead of three pieces, you have five, and you have each part saying, okay, uh, this is the header, this is my ciphertext, this is the uh, encrypted text. You have everything that is needed to uh, know, okay, how should I decrypt uh, this piece of uh, string? Uh, and you can also say, okay, encrypt 
this uh, token. The header will be uh, basically saying, okay, the content type that I have here is a token instead of application JSON or any other thing. And then uh, only people that knows how to decrypt and has access to all the, the, the keys that uh, are needed to decrypt the token will be able to uh, consume it. Right. Wow, I was a bit too fast. <laughs> um, okay, so questions? Yes, good. Interesting. Um, so, to put it in an, an actual usable example, you've got a web page. On that web page, um, you've got uh, three bits of JavaScript that need to make three AJAX requests to pull data back to show graphs or whatever. Mm -hmm. For that, when that page loads, do you, you need to somehow load in three different uh, tokens for each request? Is that correct? Uh, it depends. If you want, you can create uh, three different tokens. So the token will be the identifier for each request, or you can use a single token that has uh, like a, a bigger expiration, so you can uh, play around with a single one. It's up to you. So you, in that case, you could just send a singular identifier token and then have additional request-based parameters appended on to, say, the GET request. Would that be correct, or am I miss... Sorry, can you repeat so, it? So if you're making a GET request, mm -hmm. you might, in a traditional GET request without JWT, you okay. might, for some reason, put, like, user ID okay. and et cetera. You know, I want to get this data for this graph sort of thing. Could you... What you're saying is, is if you have one token, instead of that user ID as the identifier, you'd have the token and then your parameters afterwards to say, I want to actually get this data. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. You, you, can, you can use on that way. Uh, the benefit of it is that you know when the data changes because you have a signature there. But uh, since the, the signature, uh, the, the content uh, was created by uh, a JavaScript client, uh, I'm assuming that based on the conversation, uh, the, the JavaScript must also have the, the private key in order to generate tokens. If you are creating the, the, the keys on the, the server side and just rendering them, then it's fine. You, yeah, you, yeah. you, you can just use them. So uh, when I have traditional sessions currently and I want to migrate them over to JWT, uh, do you have any best practices for that or should I just start over and sign out all users? Um, so, I have existing application with traditional sessions, and I want to start JWT. Okay, so if you go, uh, I will just go back. Um, here, if you go to that page, you will see uh, all the limitations that we have, and that we must understand, uh, because as I said, the token is not encrypted uh, by default. And to encrypt it, uh, it requires some processing power, right? And now, uh, also to decrypt, you you will have to to have this delay. So maybe uh, encrypting a, a session data is not uh, really interesting. Uh, so the token will be plain. Uh, you can use and yeah. Uh, the other limitations is that. Uh, this library, it doesn't create any blacklist. So if the session data changes, uh, you are the one to uh, revoke uh, the, the, the previous token. So this is the, the kind of best practice that you need to, to, to take into consideration. Like, okay, I want to use uh, a stateless or a storage, a storage list session, but I need to know uh, what, uh, what I, uh, like, all the, the details that uh, are required in order to not uh, make my application uh, not so safe and secure, right? So if you care about all this kind of thing, uh, things, I, I would say that uh, go with a normal session because uh, if you're storing uh, important data inside of the token, 
you will compromise your security. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So I get the impression that the, you should only use this if you actually need to store some data inside, inside your token. Because otherwise, is it, is it more secure if you have all your data in your database and you just use a nonsense token? Because then you don't expose any data to the client. Um, usually, uh, you don't have any problem on exposing the expiration date or the, the date that the token was issued. The and user ID and the username and so on. Yeah. yeah, and also, yeah, the user ID is like, yeah, yeah. what the user can do with the user ID. Mm, yeah. But if you uh, store the user email in a token, then, my friend, you have a problem. Yeah. So good that um, uh, we're having so many questions. Hi, yeah. Um, I suppose one of the biggest benefits of JWT is you no longer have to store, like, in your database, a massive list of tokens. Yeah. Um, but one thing that you said that you can sort of create a blacklist. So if one of my users, um, their account's compromised or whatever, and they need to blacklist, surely I still need to store a list of um, token IDs in my database. Uh so I know which one's the blacklist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is like a, a, a trade-off. If you want to use uh, this kind of token uh, to create an authorization and an authentication flow, uh, and you really need to block tokens, you have to sort something somewhere. Because how you will know that this token uh, needs to be blacklisted or not. So. Uh, or if the user is logged on multiple places and you want to blacklist them all. So you, you need to have this, uh, all, at least the IDs of every single uh, token you, you created. But um, there's a difference on storing just the ID and the whole data. So that's the trade-off that you need to do. Uh, so, uh, I was listening about the, um, the signing. So, this, having the, the public key to sign, the client to sign the request, isn't there any type of problem on the, um, if someone steals my signing key that I get compromised? If some, well, the signing key will be the private, not the public. But if somebody uh, have access to your uh, private key, uh, key, you have a bigger problem than just the token, right? No, no. I was talking about um, the, the client signing the request for the server, maybe. I don't know if I understood the, the usually, flow correctly. Uh, usually, uh, you, you just sign the token on, uh, at the time that you're issuing it. So. Uh, if you want to, to have, like we had yesterday, the, the use case where the, both request and response are signed uh, and they are signed by different issuers, uh, then you have the private key and the public key here and the private key and the public key here. And they, don't, uh, ha they are not the same. Uh, so when uh, the client is, creates a new token, it says, okay, I'm creating the token with this ID, uh, this key, sorry. Uh, and this key ID represents uh, a public key. And the, the server will validate uh, that uh, token using the, the, the client public key. And if the, the client wants to validate your, the, the, the token that was generated on the, the, the server side, you, it will use the public key uh, of the server. So nobody knows about the private one. Thanks. For, um, for token invalidation, uh, this might be a terrible idea. Please tell me if it is. Um, would a, a way to handle that be to store, uh, instead of storing a blacklist, to store a whitelist of all the IDs of tokens that have been issued in say something like Redis, so that then they expire when the token is set to expire, and then to be able to 
blacklist something, I'd just delete it out of the whitelist. Yeah, that works fine as well. The only difference is you probably end up with more tokens on the whitelist than the, the blacklist, but yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. No, in, in that case, uh, you, you wouldn't have that problem because uh, you, like every token you issue, you will is, uh, you put the, the, the ID uh, in, uh, in Redis and it will expire uh, in uh, f some minutes. So you already have the expiration and that's granted for, uh, on the, the cache system. So uh, when the token expires, you don't have the, the, the whitelist there anymore. Uh, the validation will be, uh, is my token there? Okay, so I'm safe. Instead of, uh, is my token blacklist? Okay, uh, you are not allowed to use it. So yeah, it works fine. No, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, would, I guess I would store the ID with with the token in in Redis, so I could look it up and yeah. blacklist it. Yeah. How would you deal with um, when tokens expire when they run out of time? The expiry date has passed. Mm -hmm. um, would, would you, on the client side, on the, on the sort of JavaScript side, would you literally mostly just say, um, I don't know when this token expires because it's encrypted inside, so I can't find out when it expires, but I'll try and use it, and then the server comes back. Do you have to say, okay, the server comes back and says, sorry, this token isn't valid anymore, and so you make another request? Or could you say on the server side, well, this token is good until midday tomorrow, but it's now 11 o'clock. I'll give you a new token that will be good for some more time. Yeah, that's up to you, because the token is not encrypted, it's encoded. Uh, and you have JavaScript libraries to read the token, in, and you can see the expiration date. So, yeah, if the, the client doesn't want to, to open the token, uh, and to read it, uh, it will just say, okay, the token is invalid, or uh, you can do what you're saying. Uh, okay, your request is valid, but in five minutes the token will expire, so here's my, uh, a new token. I, will, I created that, so you don't need to bother with refresh, refreshing the token. But uh, when it expires and the client uh, didn't request anything, uh, in order to the server to to create a new token, it will be expired and period. Otherwise, you're also compromising the security of your API. Yeah, because if you're using the token as a bearer token, it just says, here's something that you gave me, or that somebody gave me, um, here's this. Um, you have to trust that bearer token is was given to the right person and hasn't been shared around. Yeah. Um, so if you then upgraded that token, that is a potential security issue because you don't necessarily know they genuinely were given the token. Yeah, but that, that happens despite of JSON Web Tokens. With OAuth, you have a bearer token as well, and you can share that token around and, and do new requests. Yeah. Any other question? All right, uh, so, oh, here, yeah. sorry. Do you have uh, somewhere I can go where I want to have a list of libraries you can use together with this? Yep, uh, this website. Uh, here, uh, just a sec. This one, JSON, uh, jwt.io. You can just uh, see uh, libraries implemented in all sorts of languages. <laughs> now, there's another question there, I think. What's the significance of the, uh, the little three letter acronyms? Sorry? Like the sub and AUD, IET. 
Okay. Are they acronyms? Yeah. The, the idea was to, to have a compact uh, representation. So, uh, JSON, token, ID, issuer, audience, subject, issued at, expires, and not before. Brilliant, thanks. There's another one. Um, so maybe it's a dummy question, but um, what's the best practice, for example, I've logged in in one tab, I generated a token, and then I open an anonymous tab, for example, should I detect, wait, you still have a valid token and just reuse it, or should I create every single time if it's, like, uh, the user authenticate, generate a new token? Uh, you, you're basically talking about the two sides, right? <laughs> the JavaScript or the client side and uh, the API. Yeah, the, the API must receive a request in order to, to know if the token was used or not. So if the token is stored in the local storage, the, the API doesn't know unless we have a request, right? Yep. So uh, I'm not sure, but I think that on a anonymous tab they, and a, a normal tab, they don't share the, the local storage no, area. No, no, so that's the idea. So for example, I generated a new, I've, I'm logging in basically on two different computers, for example. Okay. Should I try and reuse the same token or generate a new one every single login? If you always, u always use the same token, you have a security issue because someone can just get the token and use it because, uh, yeah, it's there and it's JavaScript. It's, yeah. You can just read the token and get it. So uh, I wouldn't recommend to reuse the token. If you're logging in uh, and... Yeah, just create a new token for that session. And yeah. make that expires like in few moments, like 20 minutes at most. So, and also have a way to refresh the token. All these um, refreshing mechanisms and um, a a granting mechanisms are already covered by OAuth. So you can use OAuth creating a uh, access tokens with uh, JSON web tokens and just use that. It's nice because then you can store things into the token and you can read on the client side and, and present some information if you want. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. No more questions? All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much and please.